Our session today will focus on alcohol and substance use disorders. The objectives for this session are to define substance use disorders using the DSM-5 definition, and then learn about the diagnostic criteria for general and specific types. By the way, I assume you have heard about the DSM. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. We are now in the fifth edition of this. Uh, it's the product of more than a decade of war efforts by uh, hundreds of, uh, of uh, experts uh, in all aspects of mental health. So back to the topic here, we uh, will also cover risk factors and uh, ideology of substance use disorders, as well as highlight uh, some existing uh, treatment approaches. Uh, we won't cover these uh, approaches, uh, these topics exhaustively, but uh, uh, may go back to uh, specific uh, themes uh, uh, related to treatment in future lectures. Alcoholism, is also called alcohol use disorder, is a medical diagnosis in which a person cannot control how much alcohol uh, they drink. The condition also causes distress or harm in one's life. Uh, it is chronic and uh, lifelong, and it can get worse over time, and uh, it can be life-threatening. Substance use disorder, sometimes called also substance abuse, happens when a person's use of certain drugs or certain substance, including alcohol, tobacco. Uh, when this use causes health problems or problems at work, school, or home. So in order to diagnose alcohol or substance use disorders, we follow the DSM-5. And the DSM-5 requires specific criteria to be met before an official diagnosis is made. There are four categories for, for this criteria. The first one is impaired control, which includes four different uh, criteria listed here, including uh, having difficulty cutting down or stopping, as well as other uh, criteria related to the amount of time and efforts spent in, in securing or obtaining uh, uh, the drug or the substance. The second category is about social impairment and include three elements, things like continuing to use despite the various problems the use may cause to the patient. So social cost is evident here as a salient feature in this category. The third category focuses on the risky patterns of use. This includes two criteria focusing on the hazardous pay, uh, patterns of use and use in the presence of other medical and psychological conditions that are made worse by the use. The fourth category focuses on the pharmacological attributes of addiction. And here we have two criteria focusing on the presence of tolerance and uh, withdrawal. Uh, we will highlight this uh, uh, a little bit later. So in providing a diagnosis, it's also important to specify the level of dependence or severity that usually depends on the number of criteria or symptoms identified. Uh, you can also identify at what stage of remission the patient is at, uh, that is if, if the patient is already uh, in recovery. 
So relevant to this DSM definition of substance use disorder, it's also important to appreciate the concept of dependence versus abuse. Uh, you can think of these two elements, two aspects of drug use as residing on different ends of the disease process. So abuse is an intense desire to obtain increasing amount of a particular drug to the exclusion of all other activities. But this is not happen, does not happen consistently in terms of time. Uh, so chronicity or regularity of the behavior tend to be uh, limited. On the other hand, dependence is the body's physical need or addiction to specific drug. So here we talk about direct physical harm where stopping can result in withdrawal and can be more difficult due to physical attributes associated with, with the dependence. Uh, there are a few symptoms I would like to highlight here that distinguish pathology from non-pathological use of substances. These are tolerance, withdrawal, compulsive use, and substance-related problems. Uh, there are physical signatures for the first three, while the last one reflects the dysfunction uh, in, in terms of life patterns and social uh, activities. For withdrawal, there are clusters of symptoms that must be present, and they tend to be specific to the type of uh, substance people use. These symptoms can be highly distressing, and avoiding them or getting a relief from them can be a motivating factor to continue to use. On the other hand, for tolerance, there are physiological processes that occur after extended period of use. These processes impact certain neurobiological pathways, including the dopaminergic system. And the phenotype of this is the presence of state of progressively decreased responsiveness to a substance. In addition, you see continuing increase in the amount the, of the substance taken uh, by the individual to be able to reach the desired effect uh, or intoxication. So that escalation results in various receptor adjustment and metabolic changes, but they can contribute to the severity of the addiction and the long-term harmful effects of the substance. Another cardinal feature of addiction is the drive, the compulsive drive to use. Here you see a loss of control over the use, so the patient would just continue using for a long period of time. Indeed, the patient's life becomes centered around securing the substance and using it. Uh, this happened at the cost of other important aspects of their personal or social interests and obligations. This could also happen in the face of a strong desire to stop or to control the use. This slide here focuses on the need to pay attention to the specific effects of each of the uh, substances that people may be using. This could come handy as you try to diagnose any acute presentation. 
Signs of uh, drug use or intoxication and symptoms may vary depending on the type of drug and the amount of drug being used. But speaking of the type of drug, uh, for cannabis and marijuana use, you may see a sense of euphoria or feeling high, a heightened sense of visual, auditory, and taste perception. You may also see increased blood pressure and heart rate. You may see red eyes, a dry mouth, and decreased coordination. For meth, uh, cocaine, and other stimulants, you may see feeling of exhilaration and excessive uh, confidence. You may see increased alertness, you may see increased energy and restlessness, as well as aggression. You may see also rampant or uh, rapid or rambling speech, uh, confusion, and you may also see delusions and hallucinations. Opioid painkillers and other narcotic signs may include reduced feeling of pain, uh, agitation, uh, drowsiness or sedation, uh, slurred speech, problems with attention and memory, uh, lack of awareness or inattention to surrounding people and things, and problems with coordination. Uh, there are also synthetic drugs like uh, spice and bath salts or synthetic cathinones. And the intoxication symptoms for these may include a sense of euphoria or feeling high, elevated mood, uh, an altered sense of visual, auditory, and taste perception, uh, extreme anxiety or agitation. You may also see paranoia and hallucination. Uh, maybe an increased uh, drive uh, for uh, sexual behavior. You may see problems thinking clearly, as well as uh, loss of uh, muscle control. For hallucinations like LSD and PCP, uh, you can see hallucinations, uh, reduced perception of reality, uh, for example, you may see uh, interpreting inputs from one of one senses as another, such as hearing uh, colors. Uh, uh, you may uh, see impulsive behaviors. You may see rapid shifts in emotions, uh, a feeling of being separated from your body and surroundings. Uh, you may see aggressive and possibly, possibly violent uh, behaviors. And you also see involuntary eye movements. For benzodiazepine, these include uh, sedatives such as diazepam, Valium, and Alprazolam, which is Xanax. And hypnotics, uh, you may see symptoms uh, like uh, uh, drowsiness, uh, slurred speech, uh, lack of coordination, uh, readability, uh, or changes in mood. You may see problem concentrating or thinking clearly, and you, say, you may see also memory problems. Uh, there are other types of drugs of abuse, but the lessons here is the pattern of presentation and signs of intoxication can vary substantially, and the management of such a uh, situation would have to account for, this, uh, for these different presentations and different symptoms. Substance use problems are highly prevalent in the society, and indeed their prevalence in ambulatory or outpatient primary care settings can exceed 20% of the patients. Uh, there is a human and economic impact of this problem. Uh, we'll talk about certain aspects of the human cost soon, but for the economic cost in the US alone, it is close to quarter of a trillion dollars annually. This slide shows the cost of addiction in human lives. Here, just for 
opioid use in the US, we see that the number of deaths associated with opioid use until 2019 was close to 50,000 uh, people in the US died from opioid overdose. Um, this slide shows death due to, to drug overdose. This is more than just opioids. The number here goes up to more than 70,000 in uh, 2019. Next, we talk briefly about the ideology of alcohol and substance use disorders. The big question here is, why do people get addicted to substances? There are many risk factors. Some are modifiable and some are not modifiable. Some of the risk factor could be, for example, having parents and siblings and friends who use alcohol and other substances. We know that drug addiction is more common in some families and likely involves genetic predisposition. Of course, a parent or a partner or peers who drink too much or misuse drugs can also facilitate and increase one's risk. Uh, this sort of social risk factors could contribute to the access to substances and to normalizing use behaviors. There could also be other biological factors such as uh, needing more and more of drugs or alcohol to get the same high, the same effect, which we mentioned earlier as uh, tolerance. A history of mental illness uh, or mental health uh, disorders such as depression, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, or post-traumatic stress disorder can increase the risk for being addicted to drugs. Also a history of uh, childhood physical or sexual abuse can be a risk factor for a substance use disorder. Um, in these cases, using, this, using the drugs or the substance can become a way to cope with painful feelings such as an anxiety, depression, loneliness, sad memory, and can make these problems even worse. But in the short term, the motivator is to kind of escape these adverse and sad uh, experiences and uh, memories. Let me just go back again. Other risk factors include early use. Uh, this is indicated by the observations that using drugs as the, at an early age can cause changes in the developing brain and increase the likelihood of progressing to drug addiction. Of course, if a person does like the drug and continues to draw, re draw reinforcement from the drug, then this will increase the risk for addiction on that substance of that drug. This will be specific to the type of substance of addiction. For example, drugs such as stimulants or opioids or, uh, or painkillers uh, may result in faster development of addiction than other drugs. Also, if you smoke a drug or inject it, you get that bolus effect and that increases the potential for addiction quickly. On the other hand, taking drugs considered less addicting, uh, so-called light drugs, uh, can start you on a pathway of drug use and addiction that may, that may be a little bit slower. It's important to recognize here uh, that whether you become addicted to alcohol or other substances uh, will depend on the combination of environmental, psychological, and genetic uh, factors. Your environment, including some of the factors we mentioned earlier, like whether you had friends or family members who misused uh, drugs or alcohol, uh, may introduce you to the substance, may make it easy for you to access a substance that can increase uh, the risk. But once a person starts misusing drugs or alcohol, uh, 
then their genetics can play a role in how quickly they become addicted. The chemicals in drugs and alcohol also change the brain and make a person more likely to use them again. So then comes the reinforcement you draw from the drugs. And this could vary depending on the psychological profile of the person, the level of stress in their lives and the level of mental health vulnerability they have. So the development into addiction may be influenced by inherited genetics and psychological tra traits that may delay or speed up the disease uh, progression as well as the pattern and the chances for recovery or for overcoming this, uh, this addiction. We've learned a lot about the contribution of genetics from twin studies and the data showed that inheritability for drug abuse ranges from 40 to 60 percent, although some differences do exist between the different types of addiction and different substances. This slide shows examples of contribution of genetic factors to initiate and continue to use tobacco. And as you can see, transition to dependence is a highly influenced by genetic factors. Physical addiction appears to occur when repeated use of a drug changes the way your brain feels pleasure. So the addicting drug causes physical changes to cluster of neurons in different parts of the brain. Changes also occur in the synthesis release and effects of various neurotransmitters that include the dopaminergic and the endogenous opioid system. These changes can remain long after one stops using the drug and can influence effects of drug as well as response to environmental events, as well as your ability to recover and to overcome addiction or your, your increased risk for relapse after trying to stop. Genetic factors influence all these processes and the pace of changes across these stages of the addiction cycle. We will discuss treatment options in future lectures, but uh, for now, treatment for an alcohol use disorder depends on how severe it is, uh, how heavy the drinking is, and the negative uh, impact or consequences of this drinking behavior on the patient's life. Uh, treatment for alcohol use disorder can include counseling, uh, behavior therapy, uh, and medicine. Some people may need to stay in a treatment center or facility for a few uh, weeks or sometimes several weeks. Again, depending on the severity of the symptoms and the pervasiveness of the diagnosis. Uh, many people also attend supportive groups like uh, Alcoholic Anonymous uh, to talk to others and get support from people who have had similar problems in the past. After treatment, some people stop drinking and stay sober for a while. Uh, others have periods of being sober, but then start drinking again and uh, may need treatment, may need uh, to go back for uh, extensive treatment as well. Uh, in fact, because of that, preventing a relapse is the biggest challenge in treatment of substance use disorder. Strategies here for the prevention of relapse may include uh, multiple things. Uh, primarily among them is sticking with the aftercare treatment plan, even if the patients have been successful in abstinence for a while. 
and the aftercare may include uh, taking medications such as naltrexone. Uh, it may also include avoiding high-risk situation. We also emphasize the need to seek help immediately if the patient starts again uh, drinking or using. Uh, for the treatment for all other substance use disorders, the approaches tend to be similar across different substances. Uh, treatment usually include medication and behavior therapy. Uh, they would be better to be used together. Uh, treatment would start with a detoxification, uh, which tries to wean patients off the substance as quickly and safely as possible while dealing with the withdrawal symptoms. This may require admission to a hospital or a residential treatment center. Uh, withdrawal se severity and symptoms vary by the different categories of uh, substances. Uh, so approaches to detoxifications tend to be uh, different for different substances. Uh, in addition to gradually reducing the dose of the drug, a clinician could temporarily substitute other substances uh, to help with that with the recovery. This may include methadone, uh, propronorphine, or a combination of uh, propronorphine and naloxone uh, for uh, opioids, um, or in the case of opioid addiction. But an important component of treatment is always behavior therapy, because that can help people manage the cues around them that may increase their risk of relapse. And behavior therapy can be provided by a psychologist or a psychiatrist and may be done with an individual, but could be done also with a family or in a uh, group therapy uh, setting. The goal here is to help patients develop ways to cope with drug craving, uh, also ways to uh, develop and implement strategies to avoid drugs and prevent relapse and avoid all the triggers that may uh, get them to use again. Another important benefit of this additional treatment is the focus on other mental health conditions. This is important because mental health comorbidity, such as uh, depression and an anxiety are highly prevalent in patients with substance use disorder. These additional uh, components of treatments can be very helpful to prolong the period of recovery. These comorbidities should be addressed and treated directly as this would increase chances for a positive outcome for both substance use disorder and the mental health issue. Treatment here may also focus on issues related to occupational and legal problems and relationships with the family and friends. And because of that, the treatment team may include other professionals, including social workers and uh, other caseworkers. Uh, finally, treatment can take place in an inpatient or outpatient settings. Of course, a severe, a severe level of substance use disorder may require staying inpatient at a treatment center for several weeks, as we alluded earlier. Thank you. We will reconnect soon on another topic.